Hello, and welcome to I Am Not For Everyone, the podcast for those looking to release shame, heal from trauma, and feel really, really good being their fully expressed, authentic selves. My name's Dr. Lee, and I am a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner and a certified clinical trauma professional, as well as a mom, wife, and a human being navigating the world with complex PTSD. Season one of this podcast came about because I was tired of spending decades living in a shame-filled, trauma-laden body and brain. And after doing a lot of work and learning how to return to a safe, grounded place in my life, I knew it was time for me to take my experience and education and use my voice to unsilence myself, to release the leftover shame, and to give others permission to do the same. On season two of this podcast, I'm going to be sharing my experience and education But even more importantly, I'm going to be bringing on some incredible guests who are going to unsilence themselves. They're going to share their own stories of trauma, shame, and their journeys to healing, resiliency, and self-acceptance. While I believe these episodes will be deeply impactful, I do want to add a disclaimer that we're going to be talking about some potentially triggering topics. So please take the invitation to pause or skip or fast forward on any episode and to treat yourself gracefully and kindly after each time that you listen. Let's dive in. Hello, welcome. I really came into today. I don't have a uh, an, an agenda as much as I normally do on these, just full transparency. Um, I want to talk about three of the ways that I think like are trendy for us to participate in a flight response uh, in our society today. And I wanted to just check in with y'all and see if you have any questions, um, anything that you think you're like, oh, is this a flight behavior? behavior? Is this something I'm uh, potentially participating in? Um, asking any questions about flight um, whatever feels good there. Uh, also before I forget, cause I will forget if you haven't signed up for next week's, um, 10 second protocol training, which there will be a replay for, if you can't attend live, you definitely want to do that. It's going to be so amazing. Um, I'm going to be teaching y'all my proprietary 10 second protocol for really, uh, ensuring that you can have the most satisfying, uh, amazing relationships, both internally and with yourself and with others. And like literally teaching you a a 10 second tool that you can use that like radically changes that, which there's not a lot of things out there that I feel like I can say this radically changes your life in 10 seconds. But like, this is the thing that helps me retain clients. This is the thing that helps me, um, really create mutually beneficial relationships. This is the thing that helps me, helps me save my marriage with my husband Um, This is the thing that has helped me be a much better parent, a calmer parent, a happier parent, um, and just like a better and happier, more aligned human overall. So uh, definitely sign up for that. Um, Share it with your friends. If you uh, would like, Uh, I would greatly appreciate that. You can invite them into the group here. We're going to be streaming the live stream into the group. You won't be able to ask questions here, but if you're on Zoom, you can, you'll actually be able to interact with me. So either way, whichever feels safer or better for you, you can do. So moving on, uh, flight. So what is flight? Just a really quick recap. The last few weeks we talked through the fight response, right? And we talked through the fawn response. So, uh, fight, flight, and fawn are all sympathetic nervous system activation responses. So all of these occur when our sympathetic nervous system is activated, meaning when we are, our body is sensing a threat, right? So fight is when we actually feel like there's something in front of us that we can beat, that we can, um, like we're the predator and it's the prey, right? Like we're able to fight this thing off. We're able to use our strength in order to um, defeat this thing in front of us. So a lot of times we use flight energy uh, when we are, um, the example I used was like people who really love adrenaline, uh, right? People who really love to healthcare providers, people who really like to fight cancer, fight sickness, um, fight disease, uh, military, or um, which by the way, if any, we have any veterans and or active military watching, thank you for your service. You know, it, people who literally actively fight, right? Um, first response personnel, all of these people. Uh, and Oftentimes, uh, that's like a 
a way that we can do that in a broad way in our lives. And oftentimes we also participate in fight through being passive aggressive or through snapping at our kids or snapping at our spouse or like actually fighting, right? Being aggressive or passive aggressive with our words. So that's one of the sympathetic nervous system activation um, threat responses. The other one we talked about is fawning, right? And we talked about fawning because oftentimes it happens in uh, as a response to fight, as a response to when somebody else is in fight mode towards us and when we feel like we are prey. And yet we don't quite feel helpless yet. We're like, oh, okay, you know, let me see if I can undo this. Let me see if I can change this person's response. Let me see if I can make this person feel like less of a threat, right? So fawning, people pleasing or attaching and crying for help is um, still an active thing that we do in order to change uh, whatever threat is in front of us, right? So these three things, including flight, which we're going to talk about today, are ways that we still feel like we have some agency. We still feel like we have some control. So these are manipulative, and I don't use that word with the uh, the... A connotation that a lot of people think of it as, right? Manipulation isn't bad. We're all constantly manipulating ourselves and other humans. Like that's what we do as people. And so these are manipulative uh, behaviors. These are manipulative responses, meaning that I still feel like I have agency. I feel like I have control in potentially changing the situation. Moving forward, we're going to start talking um, next week about helpless threat responses, responses that happen inside of us when we don't feel like we have agency, when we don't feel like we have control, when we don't feel like we can manipulate the situation to allow for our survival. Okay. So flight is a really interesting one. And uh, I I put a, a post about this earlier in the week. Hey, Julie. Hey, Sarah. I put a post up about this earlier in the week where I was talking about how as someone who likes to uh, invite people to think differently, as someone who likes to invite people to uh, question the way that they are thinking about things, to look at things from a different perspective, to reframe, that means that I am going to, on good, like on on, on a, a good amount of the time, I'm going to activate people. I'm going to say things that are not meant to be um, harmful and are meant to be a little bit triggering, are meant to be a little bit activating, right? And it's not done from a place of, I want to cause harm and I want to cause threat. It's done from a place of, I want to kind of wake this, wake the person up who's reading this or, or kind of like jolt the person who's reading this out of whatever they're in and make them go, whoa, wait, ooh, that, I feel something reading this. I feel some kind of way listening to this live, right? These lives are a little bit intentionally activating because your activation is what makes you sit up and and, and um, kind of lean in in your chair and go, ooh, I want to hear more of this, right? So I put up this, this post that was intentionally activating, not from a, um, a threatening perspective, but from a, hey, like this is likely going to make some people feel some things. And by the way, this is a a technique that I teach in the TRIP certification is how to have a conversation with somebody where you know it's going to cause activation, but where you know that you can also support them around that, where you're going to call them in instead of calling them out. So I put up this post and I had like five or six people unfriend me. And I knew that this was going to happen because I knew that I was going to trigger the flight response in a few people. and. In doing that, it was such a beautiful example of what emotional regulation can do for us as humans and what learning how to be emotionally regulated, learning what to do when we get activated can do for us as humans. Because unfriending, ghosting is another term, right? Like uh, saying you're going to be somewhere and then not being there, or saying you're going to do something and then not doing it. Um, saying you're going to be supportive some in some way and then not showing up in that way. Those are fight or excuse me, those are flight responses. Those are responses to us getting emotionally activated in our body and someone doing something that we don't like 
or someone doing something that we disapprove of or something, someone doing something that we are judgmental about, or that doesn't feel good for us in our body. And instead of choosing, um, fight, right. Or instead of choosing fawn or instead of not choosing a threat response at all, instead of returning back to a emotionally regulated state and then making a decision, we choose um, flight. And what I will say is this, is that if you grew up in going back to last week, where we talked about attachment, right? If you grew up having avoidant attachment modeled for you, or if you grew up, um, let's say if you grew up in a house where people frequently um, fought and the only way for you to like get out, uh, get away for that or for it to feel safe was for you to leave, was for you to go up to your room, was for you to leave the house, whatever, that you may have learned that flight is the way when there is uh, danger, right? When there are people arguing, when there is disagreement, when there is discord, which does not feel good, when there is that psychological threat, fight is what you do in order to get out of or get away from that threat. Now that's the unfriending piece, right? That's the, like little kids do this all the time, right? I have three kids and they oftentimes come home from school and say, yeah, I'm not friends with, with Sarah or um, uh, Jamie anymore because they did X, Y, Z, right? And we have a conversation about how we don't just run away when people do something that we don't like. We actually figure out if this is a pattern. Do we, does it not feel good for us to be around them on a consistent basis? Like, can we move from intentionality instead of just urgently saying, nope, I'm cutting this person off. They're not my friend anymore. I don't want to see them. I don't want to hear them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Right. No one's, no one in here has ever done that. Right. (laughs) I've done it. So when we unfriend, when we cut people off, I've seen this, uh, this example in, in families too, where fam- some families have a very low threshold for when you are allowed in the family and when you are cut off from the family, right? Uh, w- like some families are like, oh, you didn't, you didn't tell us that you weren't coming to Thanksgiving. So like, you're not allowed to come to Christmas, right? Like only knowing how to cut people off. Sometimes that's really what we're taught. We're taught um, and, f- and flight, especially with unfriending, is based in a very black and white um, shame perpetuated system of thinking where it's you're either in or you're out. You're either right or you're wrong. You're either good or you're bad. You're either one of us or you're one of them. And when we think about life in black and white like that, when we have had morals and values that have been, um, you know, uh, programmed into us that we have learned that we have not really like, especially from an early age that we didn't choose to learn. When you think of some of the unwritten rules of your family of, or of your, whatever social systems that you're in, those boundaries are created using shame. Those boundaries are creating, created using shame. So what I mean by that is that if you do something that causes you to be cast out of the group, that's a shameful thing, right? We're going to shame you and say, basically, if you continue to do this, you don't get to be part of our group. And so a lot of us learn to think in black and white thinking. A lot of us learn to think in, okay, if I am in an argument with somebody, they want only one of us can be right. Only one of us can be right. And so if this person is saying something across from me that I disagree with and that I don't think is right, that means they're not right. And so what we do is we take this person's belief or this person's perspective or this person's statement or their behavior and we say, okay, that's representative of who they are as a whole. And so we assign all of that to their character. This thing that they're thinking is bad, so they're bad. And what I will say is this, is that when you can understand that when people do things that are bad, that doesn't mean that they're bad. When you can get to a level of compassion and empathy and emotional regulation for yourself and a understanding that people are a product of their learning, when you can do that, 
it really changes how you then decide if you're going to cast people in or out. It really changes how you are going to, if you're going to use shame as a mechanism to keep people in or out of your spaces, or if you're going to use compassion and empathy and intentionality as a way to determine if you're going to keep people in or out of your spaces, right? And this also goes to like, are you, if you're setting up barriers instead of boundaries, I see this a lot with flight is flight. We go, you know what? Nope. I'm throwing up a barrier. You're not allowed to come in. (laughs) I'm going to run this other direction and you're not allowed to follow me. Right. And what I want you to also notice here is some of the, the behavior that I'm describing from a flight perspective feels a little fighty as well. And that's because their sympathetic nervous system, they're both sympathetic nervous system driven. They're both active ways of trying to discharge threats. So a lot of times we, we combine fight and flight behaviors together. So in going back to this example of my post, right? Some people are going to come in the comments and they're going to argue and they're not going to take a chance to recognize or the time to recognize that we could both be right or that we could both be wrong or that we're both right and we're both wrong because neither of us is fully right or wrong. No one is fully right or wrong. And my reality versus your reality are not the reality. So some people are going to come on there and fight, which most people didn't. Um, I think a lot of people don't come on my posts and fight anymore because I don't fight back. And so it's not fun. (laughs) It's not fun when I don't engage back in an activated way with people who come on my posts to fight. So they're, they don't, there's like, they don't get that itch scratched with me. So I think they just then go, okay, I'm not even going to say anything or I'm just going to unfriend. And so that unfriend is the, the flight. It's the, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to have to determine if Lee is actually a good person or a bad person or like whatever. And although I I thought I liked her, she's saying this thing that goes so against what I think or what I believe that I just can't be friends with her or I can't have her in my space. So like, I'm just going to go, right? And what I want you to see is that there is nothing wrong with unfriending someone. There is nothing wrong with deciding that it doesn't feel good to have someone in your space. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's a great thing. It is good to put up boundaries to determine what our needs are. And if other humans consistently violate those boundaries or are unable to or get like basically prevent us from meeting our own needs, then it's good to put up um, some really good boundaries and some guidelines around, hey, you are allowed to do whatever you want. And if you do that, I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to remove myself from the space. I'm going to end this conversation. I'm not going to come to this event because it's my responsibility to take um, care of my own needs. So by the way, we can do an entire we can do an entire module on boundaries. We will. And by the way, the trip certification uh, that we're launching next week, um, we I do a whole module, a whole teaching on boundaries uh, and what that means because boundaries are actually uh, really important when it comes to threat responses. Those of us who haven't been taught to set healthy boundaries or who had unhealthy boundaries, unhelpful boundaries set around us oftentimes participate more in these threat responses instead of uh, moving through life emotionally regulated because boundaries are required for emotional regulation. So yeah. So Deborah says I unfriend when I realize I'm getting repeatedly triggered by them. The ownership is on me. I'm having a hard time regulating when I see them. So I'm going to step away. Yeah. So this is gorgeous. This is the exact example of what I'm saying is it is not unhealthy to unfriend or to pause people or to like, what is it? Take a break from people on Facebook or social media or to give yourself some space. If you're recognizing that you're unable to have a conversation with this person or be in a space with this person without getting triggered. If your goal is to remove yourself from that situation so that you can become emotionally regulated, that is entirely different. That is an entirely different uh, strategy mindset than just unfriending and being like, Oh, I can't stand. Right. I can't do it. That is different. So it's, 
so really with all of these threat responses, there's nothing wrong with getting in a physical altercation with somebody if you are protecting someone that you love or something that you love, right? There is there is a difference between intentional, emotionally regulated behavior where you are doing what is in alignment with your morals and values and how you want to show up with the world and uh, doing and participating in fight or flight or fawn behaviors that really don't feel good once you're out of that moment. Do you see the difference? If I pause and look back and think about a, a friendship that I have with somebody online or in person, and I'm like, you know, every time I'm in their space, this doesn't feel good. Every time I'm in their space, I'm getting activated. I'm, I'm not feeling good. Like this just feels wrong. Then I need to get in, be intentional about how I am going to set up boundaries around being in space with this person. Do I only go in my husband is available. So like, if I need to squeeze his leg when they say something, or I need to like, or he, he needs to, uh, like, he's able to give me the, the like, Hey, you know what? I think I'm tired and I want to go. Like if, if, if that's required for me to be in the space, that's okay. Great. All right. That's what I'm going to use in order to stay emotionally regulated. And when I can't be emotionally regulated anymore, I'm going to go. That is really, really healthy behavior. And that's intentional. If you are operating from urgency and clicking the unfriend button and going away and then being activated for 30 minutes to an hour after that, you can't stop thinking about the post and you can't stop, you know, your, you, your mind's ruminating over the thing that probably was an urgent decision. That probably was a decision made out of being in threat response and isn't something that actually is in alignment with how you want to show up. So what are some other examples of flight response? Well, another example is, uh, and I mentioned this before, is what we call ghosting, right? And ghosting is actually the opposite of this unfriend response because ghosting actually usually happens when someone does believe in you, does like want something from you, does trust you, does want to be in your space, does desire to work with you wants to be in connection and you feel a psychological threat there because you don't feel like you're going to meet, be able to meet their needs. Or the other time I see ghosting happen is where an uncomfortable conversation needs to occur for us to be like boundaries need to get set for me to feel like I could feel good in this situation. And I don't know how to set those boundaries. I don't feel comfortable setting those boundaries. I don't know how to have that uncomfortable conversation. And so I'm just going to peace out. So notice this is around boundaries again, right? So let's talk about the first example. The first example is, you know, I have a client who really wants to work with me. And I have some subconscious programming. I've got some limiting beliefs. I've got some past painful experiences and traumas that have taught me that the false belief that I'm not trustworthy, that I don't deserve to be paid for my work, that I am going to mess this up somehow. And so instead of letting that person down later, instead of, uh, you know, like potentially screwing things up later, we go ahead and intentionally screw it up now. And it's really not intentional, but we go ahead. Our subconscious brain is like, you know what? The, the, I can't handle this potential screw up. Like I I don't want to have to think about this all the time. So I'm just going to go ahead and screw it up now because then I can like release myself from all of that pressure moving forward. And this does go to this, this is trust. This is self-trust. So um, it is, it has to do with you not believing something about yourself and you not believing that you're going to be able to um, deliver on whatever it is that this person wants, whatever they're asking for. And so you go ahead and sabotage it now as a protective measure, because then it's, it's, it's a way for certainty. The uncertainty of whether or not you're going to be able to do this is too uncomfortable. And so we create certainty right now, even though it's painful and even though it perpetuates the cycle. 
Because when we go ahead and create certainty right now by saying, you know what, I'm going to ghost them. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to follow through. Um, and I'm not going to talk to them about it either. You create one more situation where others can't trust you and where you can't trust yourself. And so you actually, if the more we do this, the more evidence we create that we are an untrustworthy uh, human. And so the more likely we're going to ghost on people in the future when we uh, get, you know, the gumption to actually try again, right? So I see this in clients. This is one of the most common behaviors I see in clients, by the way. And usually what we end up doing in our sessions is we go down deep, 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 deep and find where are the situations and where is that, like, where is that belief coming from? And we like clear it out. And I, again, only do that in specific circumstances where I know that that's the thing that needs to happen. And I know that that person is safe and I know that person is supported and all of those things. And I have clients in here who will tell you that like that we have had sessions where we figure out why they are ghosting. We figure out why they are fleeing. And like the next week they get three clients, <laughs> right? Uh, because we've removed the actual problem, which is not that they're untrustworthy. The problem is, is that they think that they're untrustworthy. The problem is, is that their body um, still remembers and believes that they are untrustworthy. And so we have to shift the belief instead of shifting the behavior. Two very different things. Uh, also, this is why, by the way, if you've gone to talk therapy for like years and you haven't like around a specific issue and you haven't changed your behavior, this is why, because you're talking about it and you're trying to change the behavior instead of trying to change the belief that's driving the behavior and, or the, or clearing out and reframing the, the experiences that are driving that behavior. So that is the first way is like, we don't trust ourselves. We're afraid we're going to let the other person down. The other thing is, is that this is a situation where oftentimes we ghost after we've fawned. We ghost after we've fawned. So Somebody comes to us and we go into people pleasing mode and we, cause we really don't want to make them upset. And then like later on, we're out of that threat response and we're sitting there and we're like more regulated. And we're like, why did I agree to that? Ugh, I don't want to do that. Like that, that doesn't feel good. Or like, I agreed to that for way little, like way too little money, or that's going to take way too much time. Or like, I just don't want to do that. My needs aren't going to get met doing this for this person. This is not a mutually beneficial experience, right? And so then we ghost because we don't want to follow through. Yeah, ignoring. So my sister, my sister and I were just talking about this. Uh, she was like, you can bring up the experience of how like my student loan service representative keeps calling me and I keep sending him straight to voicemail because I can't deal with that right now, right? It's the, ooh, ooh, I have, I have gotten myself into something that I do not want to be in. And cause I didn't know how to say no. And so now I'm going to say no in a way that like, I don't really even have to say no, cause I don't even have to talk to them. Right. And this again can come from this, this again is, is based in self-trust as well of like trusting that you can clean this up, trusting you can handle it, trusting you can figure it out. Trusting that like, even if this other person gets mad at you, you can find a way to move forward and it might not feel good from a, like, you might have to do some stuff you don't want to do. Cause like you agreed to it, or you might have to break a contract or you might have to, um, to like, you know, uh, renegotiate. Like you may have to do something that like in the moment feels hard right? It feels activating. It doesn't feel good. But on the other side of that, it feels so good because you actually showed up and handled the thing. So this is, um, this is something that I talk to a lot of my clients about of like, let's pick days where we have a lot of, where we have more energy and we have more mental real estate and we feel more emotionally regulated to tackle all of those things that like, we don't, that we're like, oh, I think I might people, or like, here's another example. If you think you're going to make a phone call and you think you might fawn during that phone call, you just don't make the phone call. 
if you think you're going to agree to something that you don't want to do, you just don't make the phone call. So you don't agree to the thing you don't want to do. Instead of learning how to be regulated, how to hold yourself through that experience, how to say no, even though your, your brain is screaming at you to like fawn and people please and say yes, how to do this and how to hold yourself through it and handle whatever happens on the back end. Because for a lot of us, we have wounds um, where we really don't, it feels really, really crappy to make other people feel upset. When we, when other people are upset with us, it feels like we are dying. And so we would much rather just avoid the conversation entirely. This is hard stuff. And, and uh, this is why I, I kind of talked about at the beginning about that post. I know that what I'm saying in these videos can be really activating. I know that this can make you feel the feels. I know that I frequently make people cry <laughs> during my lives, right? I know that I do this. And, and for me, and I'll just share, I, I wasn't going to go here, but I think this is gorgeous. Like for a long time, I didn't teach these things. I didn't come out and publicly speak. I didn't share my opinion. I didn't, um, you know, like I, I, I held off on, on doing this for a really long time because of my own flight behavior, because of my own fear of triggering people of my own fear of making people cry. And like, you know, making them feel something really intense. And what I've really learned is, is that for me, for holding trauma-informed spaces is it's all about consent, right? It's all about consent. It is about setting a container and knowing that people are entering into that container intentionally knowing that like this stuff might happen. And if it does, that they are grown adults and that they can take care of themselves. And if something comes up and they need further support, they can, I can trust them to ask for it. And so this is the stance that I've had to take on my Facebook posts of like, look, I, no one friends, if somebody has friended me or accepted a friend request, they're consenting to see my posts. They're consenting to get content from me. And so if they decide that that no longer feels good for them, they have the unfriend button. They have the ability to block me. They have the ability to not see what I'm saying anymore. So that's, that is the thing that I think is helpful to remember, especially if you are somebody who's watched me and you're like, oh, Lee says a lot of really hard things or like, you know, um, Lee shows up and says stuff that Whew, that's probably got to feel hard to say. That is part of the way that I do this is remembering like if I'm speaking at an event, giving people a little heads up of like, this is what we're going to talk about, right? This is where I'm going to go. If that doesn't feel good for you, shut your ears off, get play on your phone, leave the room, do whatever you'd like to do. And this is where we're going. Uh, because then if people decide to stay there, and I take them a place and it, it causes some feelings or that, you know, they, they have some stuff come up. It's consensual. And also I've said this, I think I said this on the last live, like, I'm not going to take you somewhere that I'm not able to lead you back out of. Meaning, um, that all of you, I hope in here have gotten the message. And if not, I'm going to give it to you again. Is that like, if you ever feel very dysregulated after one of these videos, or you ever feel like you need extra support, my DMs are open. Uh, I answer y'all message me a lot and I answer you frequently. And I am so happy to do that because I don't want to ever take you somewhere that like, if you have a hard time getting back out of that, you don't feel comfortable asking me for support with that. Okay. So Julie asked, I'm curious about your thoughts on knowing how to self-regulate and not ghosting on the spot versus taking the time to pause until you're resourced enough to respond. Is the goal to be able to almost always be able to self-regulate on the spot? Yes, that is actually the goal. The goal is, is to always, as often as possible, be able to self-regulate on the spot. Now, if, like I said, if you're coming to next week's training, this is what I'm teaching you this is a spoiler alert. This is what I'm teaching you. And I'm going to show you why it's, I mean, a lot of you, uh, versus people in my outside spaces, y'all know why it is important to emotionally regulate. And I'm, I'm going at it from the perspective of 
satisfying yourself and the people that you are in relationship with and retaining the people that you are in relationship with, attracting people who you really want to be in relationship with, whether that's intimately or um, professionally or on a friend basis or whatever. Emotional, the ability to emotionally regulate as often as possible on the spot is your greatest superpower. Case closed. Greatest superpower. Now, are there plenty of other things to have in your toolkit that are super help, super helpful to have? Yes. And my, I will, I will die on this hill. If you can emotionally regulate through any stressful situation, you are going to be more successful, happier, more fulfilled, and more surrounded by people that absolutely light you up to be in, in uh, community with than implementing or focusing on any other strategy. Because the ability to stop seeing threat where there isn't threat, the ability to help your body recognize that even though it feels like it's dying in that moment, it's not, is critical. So I promise to teach you all about that uh, in that training. And yeah, and, and, and why I say that that is the goal, why that is, you know, the ability to do that as often as possible is because you're not going to be able to always do it. And, or, you're going to be somebody who gets two to three seconds into their threat response and then goes, oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, hold on a second. Wait, okay. Let me take a breath. Let me relax. Let me wet noodle my body. Like, let me do the things that I know help me emotionally regulate so that I can um, have this conversation better. And I'll have to have my husband uh, or my, um, my, my family or somebody come on here at some point because they can tell you, uh, I mean, I can sit up here and tell you all day that I've learned, like learning this tool was the, the absolute game changer for me. Um, and I would love to have somebody on here who used to know me when I was much more emotionally dysregulated (laughs) to like, just have a conversation with y'all about like how different of a human I am now. Um, so what I will say is, is like, when I started getting a lot of clients, when I started being able to have like really, um, retain clients, when I got to the point that I was able to like get really, uh, clear and consistent in my messaging as an entrepreneur, when I, when I was able to start having like really deep, amazing conversations with people that I loved around hard topics was all when I was all during slash after when I learned how to start emotionally regulating. So yeah, so getting back to flight two, the other thing I just want to say is that if you are somebody who is, who makes to-do lists and then avoids them, if you are somebody who knows what needs done and find yourself avoiding that thing often, if you are somebody who's like, yeah, I know that I need to, you know, um, start putting my message out there to clients, or I know that I need to work on this project, or I know some of this is, um, brain chemistry. Some of this is if you are somebody who is neurodivergent, uh, which by the way, uh, people with significant trauma, you are neurodivergent. Just saying your brain works differently than someone who did not have a lot of trauma, uh, early in life. So if you're someone who has a lot of early life early childhood, significant traumas, you are neurodivergent, but you are neurodiver- you are neurodivergent due to um, nurture, not nature. So there's that. You are neurodivergent by um, your experiences that you've had in life versus being neurodivergent um, due to genetics, which by the way, uh, genetics also can be affected by trauma. So sometimes if we have really significant trauma, um, lines in our past that can cause genetic changes in how our brain functions. And that can also lead to neurodivergence. So the reason I brought up neurodivergence is because that, uh, the way that your brain works, it, it can create more avoidance scenarios. It can create scenarios where you are more 
avoidant of things until there is pressure on the line, until there is a threat. And so I just want to honor that and, and name that here because that's going to require different strategies than someone who is avoidant out of a um, trauma response, someone who is avoidant out of what they've learned versus how their brain is set up. So one of the things that I really love to look at when it comes to being avoidant of to-do lists, being avoidant of tasks, being avoidant of anything like that is really thinking about your yeses and your noes is really thinking about what you have agreed to do, um, to do and really looking at where are you fawning, kind of going back to what we talked about before, where are you fawning and, um, you know, saying yes to things you don't want to say yes to, or saying no to things that you want to say yes to. So your to-do list is full of yeses that should be no's and there's no, um, actual yeses that we want to have on there, on there. And so, Also looking at like flexibility of how have you, what rules and restrictions are you putting on yourself that determine whether you, uh, whether something is complete or not. And so a lot of my clients have perfectionist wounds where they, um, like they get so overwhelmed thinking about how they can do the thing perfectly and that they're not going to do the thing perfectly, that they don't end up doing it at all. And so that is where getting under those beliefs and adopting a done is better than perfect um, mindset and really like shifting that in their bodies so that they can go find evidence of that is super helpful, (laughs) Florence. Um, So like just thinking about that of how can I actually make the things that are on my to-do list fun? What are the things that I don't even really need to be doing, but I've said I'm going to do? Like, can I change those around? Can I do something differently? And really this a a lot of times does go back to shame around how can I clear out the shame around this to-do list? How can I clear out the shame around this to-do list? How can I clear out the shame around the thing that I said yes to, but I think I need to go back and say no to? Or how can I clear out the shame around um, like really uh, like honoring that I want to do something different, that I have a different yes. And then I want to say no to this. How can I do that? So yeah, I'm just reading the comments here. I'm curious who decides if you have trauma. I've been thinking about this lately. Don't we all have some form of trauma? Isn't that just life? I love this. Yeah. You're, I know you're not trying to minimize, minimize this. Um, it's a beautiful question. Yes. We all have trauma. Some of us have significant trauma to the point that our brain um, development is changed. Some of us have significant trauma to the point that the way that neurotransmitters are, um, that we learn, that our brain learns how to use and store and respond to neurotransmitters is changed. And so the interesting thing about this is that it really depends on the human. This is why some humans can go through a traumatic experience and come out on the other end and not have any long lasting effects from it. And why other humans can go through the same experience or an experience that even seems more minimal and come out significantly affected. And so uh, this is a, a really complicated conversation. And it's also why I think that it's, It is so good that we are actually starting to recognize that everyone has trauma and that everyone has an individual response to that trauma and that everyone has different brain chemistry that changes how they're able to respond to that trauma. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that, I've got some resources for you of people who talk about this. And one of the, I don't know if I have it next to me. I don't know what I did with it. Uh, one of the books is called the body bears the burden. What I will say, um, to you is this, is that if you don't enjoy, or you're not, uh, somebody who is really well-versed in like, like neuroscience or in, uh, human anatomy physiology, that book's probably going to be a little hard to get through. Cause as someone with a doctoral level education and like focusing in, on neuroscience and those things. It's, it's, uh, it's a, I love it, but it's a heavy book. Um, and also like, you're so welcome to check it out if that feels good for you. It's by Robert Scares and it's, um, the body bears the burden. Uh, 
Amabel said, trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. Yes. Beautiful definition. It's really about, because here's the thing is if, and Robert Scare talks about this. If I go through something very traumatic and I'm actually able to discharge the emotion, right? I'm able, and, and the neuro talk, the neurochemicals, the neurotransmitters that are in my body. If I'm able to discharge those and move those through at the time of the event, or if I'm able to do it after, right? I don't, if you guys remember us talking about animal shaking and having that tremor response after they've gone through something traumatic, if I'm able to complete that response after I've been either uh, in a traumatic situation um, where I was immobilized or where I was helpless, the likelihood that that trauma is going to get stored in my body and the likelihood that that event is going to affect me from a uh, brain or a body standpoint is actually much lower. So my family laughs at me sometimes because sometimes I get emotionally activated or something happens and I start doing this, right? And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm literally shaking. I am shaking out all of the neurotransmitters and the chemicals that are in my body right now and helping them get out and move. And I breathe and I sometimes like go and yell and do the things. And um, like that actually helps discharge it so that there's not a re-traumatization that occurs in that moment. But this is where a lot of times we can kind of get underwater is that we have something that happened that was traumatic. And then we have things in our lives that remind, and, and we didn't discharge it. We didn't, we weren't able to deal with it. We went into a freeze response, which we'll talk about next week. And then it gets stuck in my body. And then I have these things that pop up around me that remind me my body of the thing. And so then I have another activated moment and then I don't discharge it. And then I have another activated moment and I don't discharge it. And then that builds and it builds and it builds. And it's why um, you can have pretty significant physical and emotional and mental symptoms with very minimal stimuli. So uh, this is why it's so important to actually use the body in the um, clearing of trauma is because if we don't, we're not, we're not clearing out all of those things that happened. We're not clearing out those, that storage of what we've experienced. Let's see. Um, experiencing trauma and then having someone tell you that what you went through was not traumatic based on their standards is also traumatic. Absolutely. That is what we call gaslighting. That is a form of gaslighting is basically saying, Hey, I'm your experience is your reality is not real. And not only is your reality not real, you're like completely misunderstanding the situation. And in fact, it's like this, it's the opposite of what you've experienced. So minimalization of emotions, um, minimalization of experiences, um, being told that what you went through isn't a big deal. And by the way, we do this to our kids all the time. Our kids, something happens and they start crying and they have big feelings. We call them big feelings in our family. And we're like, oh my gosh, like you just stubbed your toe, you're fine. Or, okay, but like, that wasn't that big of a deal, was it? We do this to our kids all the time, (laughs) all the time, Uh, particularly our boys, right? Uh, Our boys, I I can think about my son, you know, them being out on the, uh, the baseball field and one of them falling and getting hurt and like significantly hurt and they, we were told the kid to like, okay, just like breathe through it, brush it off, run the bases. And then it ended up, he had broken his hand. And it's like, what, it, what would that have looked like if we actually just like let, like that kid felt safe enough to cry. That kid felt safe enough to say like, this actually hurts way more than I think that there's something like, I think there's something wrong. Right. So we do that a lot, a lot, especially with boys, girls, we, we do that too, but boys, especially we minimize their feelings and their, what they go through and don't allow them to have the, um, the emotional experience that they need uh, and have attunement with them after they have that. So if you're a parent that you're like, Ooh, (laughs) I do that. Okay, cool. I was too, still am occasionally. I have to catch myself as well. And you might be doing, you might do this to yourself as well. If, if somebody um, did this to you for a significant, a, a significant amount when you were younger, you may do this to yourself now. So you may be sick and minimize your feelings be like, Oh, I I think I'm fine. Like I'm probably just, I'm, I'm probably, I probably just need to suck it up. Right. Put my big girl panties on, go, go handle it. I'll be okay. 
um, or something happens that's like really emotionally upsetting. And you're like, okay, but like, it's not that bad because other people go through way worse than I do. And like, I'm so lucky and every, like, I have such a good life. I can't feel we do this to ourselves. Now we gaslight ourselves out of our own experiences because we've internalized that from, um, who taught us. So if you're a parent and you notice you're doing that and, or if you want to start reparenting yourself in a way that feels good, you can always use that big feelings thing of like, when you notice you are having a lot of feelings, you notice you really don't feel good or something's coming up to be like, Oh, wow. I'm having some big feelings or with your kids. Ooh, I'm noticing some big feelings here. Can you tell me more? And one of the other things that we do as a family we try to do, and I do this a lot with friends and and with really clients and anyone before I like jump in and try to, because sometimes the other thing we'll do is we try to save them. We'll fawn to like, try to get them to like, stop crying because it's so hard to handle those big emotions. We've been taught that big emotions are bad. And so it's like, as adults, we're like, stop, stop, stop. Right. So one of the other things that uh, we will ask each other when someone's having big feelings is, do you desire witnessing, comfort, or uh, strategy, right? Or witnessing, support, or strategy? Because sometimes I just want witnessing, right? Sometimes I just want you to notice the thing that I'm feeling. Uh, other times I want comfort. I want you to like, you know, ask what you can do to make me more comfortable. Like, okay, do you need a hug? Do you need to just sit here with me? Do you need to be able to vent it out more? Like, what do you need, right? And then the third thing we'll do is we'll say, that's what the word I was like, what is the word I'm looking for is solutions, strategy and solution of like, okay, how can we fix this? How can we remediate this? Like, do you want to brainstorm uh, out or talk out how you can go talk to your boss who's me, who has said some really harmful or hurtful things? Do you want to um, look at how you can get out uh, or like how we can work through all of this work that you have in front of you that feels completely overwhelming? Like, do you want that? And sometimes we say we want both, right? Or all three. I want them in this order, right? But that can be a really great way to help uh, validate and um, validate big feelings and also help people or yourself move through them in a trauma-informed way where they're really getting what they need and they're not getting the fix that you think you they need. They're getting the fix that they think they need. They're getting the, the, the support and the solutions that they need. So I kind of got off a uh, topic there, but I feel like that was a, yeah, witnessing support slash comfort or solutions. Um, definitely go sign up for next week. Go do the training. I know I'm kind of hitting hammering hard on this, but I don't know who was here at the beginning and who was here at the end. And I mean, I, I like, I'm just going to toot my own horn on this. Like, it's going to be really great. <laughs> It's going to be really good. I want you all in there to be able to learn that. So like, if you feel like you've learned a lot from these lives, this will be amped up a notch even from that. So I know that we had several people in the comments really talking about how this stirred up some stuff for them this week, which I know that happens every week. And I really just want to um, identify that you may feel flighty after this. You may feel flighty from the big feelings that you're having. You may feel kind of... um, You may feel overwhelmed or, or stressed out or have some stuff come up. And so I want to actually invite you to use this witnessing comfort solutions thing for yourself. And I also really just want to like acknowledge you to, to, um, normalize what you are going through and to, um, just love on you a little bit and say, it's so awesome that you're here. It's so awesome. You're coming to these. It's so awesome that you're learning, and you're, you're, I, I see you and I witness you and whatever has come up for you. So if you need anything, my DMs are open and I love you all. And I hope to see you next week. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Bye y'all. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about how you can help yourself and others release shame, heal from trauma, and create healthier, safer, more mutually beneficial relationships, I want to invite you to head to our website, instituteforTrauma.com. 
At instituteftrauma.com, you'll find free resources, be able to connect to our free online community, and view our courses and trainings, including our foundational trauma-informed, psychologically safe certification, aka the TRIP certification. Head to instituteforTrauma.com today to learn more.